most women start a business? Is it passion, money, or freedom? Welcome to Female Founders, the podcast that takes you behind the scene with women who are founders and CEOs to help you start and scale a successful business of your own. I am your host, Nagelia De Ravine. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Female Founders. In this episode, we are going to have a conversation with Dr. Kristen Eccleston. She is a neurodiverse teacher, education consultant, and mental health advocate. Good morning, Dr. Kristen. I am so excited to have um, to have this conversation with you. You are a, an education consultant and a mental health advocate, which is very special, especially to our children. We need that these days. And with your education and consultant firm, you are working toward changing lives by showing people how amazing they are and how they can also bring change into this world. Can you tell us how you get interested in in the education sector and in also mental health? Sure. I, you know, I feel like I fell into it a little bit. Uh, I actually started off in college working in public relations, and I don't know that I had aspirations to be a teacher, but as soon as I came out of college, it was almost like divine intervention. I had this opportunity to go back and get my master's degree from Johns Hopkins University in special education. And I felt like, oh, I can't, I can't miss an opportunity to, to get a free master's degree. I would be crazy. And I had always wanted to be a teacher. Teaching had been an interest of mine. But uh, at the time when I went off to college, I, I thought I had broader aspirations. And I went back. I went back to school. I became a special education teacher. And I absolutely fell in love with the profession. I loved working with students. I loved helping students to shine where maybe they otherwise didn't feel great about themselves in the education setting. And so I absolutely loved being a teacher. And it was towards, uh, I guess about seven or eight years ago, towards the end of my classroom time that I had an opportunity to advance in my career and oversee a special education program. And at that time it was, I had a lot of input that I could provide to that program. And I I really wanted to focus on student mental health. I didn't feel like anything existed at the time. I had worked with students in the past that had led me to believe there was an area of need for this. Uh, And so I started to create a program and worked with a fantastic team of, of individuals to really focus on mental health. And I had no idea how it would be received or the popularity that it would have. But within a t- five-year time span, we went from working with five students to 58 students in a program that wow. was really only meant to hold 40 students. Yeah. So it really showed the need that was there. And then it was at that time that I decided I would go back to school and I would get my doctorate uh, in mind, brain, and teaching and really make my research focused on mental health in the education setting because I felt like there was such a significant need. And this was even prior to the pandemic. So if anything, the pandemic has shown that this is even a more significant need than when I had initially started off on this venture. Wow, this is amazing. You know, uh, reading about you, um, you you use something that called neurodiverse teacher. What does that mean? So it actually means a couple of things. So one, I myself am neurodiverse. I am ADHD. And so I consider myself the neurodiverse teacher because I'm a teacher and I'm neurodiverse. But I also see myself as an advocate for individuals who are neurodiverse. And neurodiverse usually can house many different things, autism, ADHD, uh, dyslexia, dyscalculia, sensory processing disorder, Tourette's, all of those things are something that would fall into that neurodiverse umbrella. And it's really a different way that the brain looks at things. It's a different way that the brain processes information or, or really just sees and experiences the world. But oftentimes students who are neurodiverse get pigeonholed with these ideas that they have a disorder, you know, attention deficit disorder, autism spectrum disorder. They get a lot of negative messages on a day-to-day basis in the classroom setting that makes them feel like, oh, maybe something's wrong with the way that I learn, or maybe I'm not as capable as my peers. And so I, I fashion myself the neurodiverse teacher because I also advocate for the fact that those students are incredible 
incredibly bright individuals who, in my opinion, are the world changer, cure cancer type of students. And, and they don't get the credit that they deserve because they've been pigeonholed into this one size fits all box that is education. And their brain doesn't function that way. Their brain sees things in this much larger spectrum and takes in information much differently. And so I really feel like it's it's my job to be an advocate and show that not only to those students what they're capable of, but to the world what neurodiverse individuals are capable of. Chris, uh, Dr. Christine, one thing uh, I know for sure about you, you are, I don't think you realize what you are doing, how big it is. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. I, I just feel very passionate. And, and I hope that's of anything I convey. That is how I feel is the passion. And and I think a lot of that comes down to so many people, especially students who I've worked with who are neurodiverse, feel so bad about themselves. And I can relate to it as someone who was an undiagnosed neurodiverse individual. It really impacts your self-esteem, um, how you think people view you, what you think you're capable of achieving. And, and I don't want our students to come out of high school and have to spend the next decade building their confidence back up or having to rediscover who they are, what they actually are capable of because of those negative messages that they got. I want them to really be able to come out of college excuse me, out of high school going into college with this idea that I can take on the world. I know I'm capable. Yeah, my brain sees things differently, but that's something that's on my side. I'm unique. I'm an individual. I can be creative. I can make these things that other people can't instead of these ideas that like, oh, maybe I'm not as smart or maybe I'm not as capable because that that's, in my opinion, the furthest from the truth. And I think it's a real detriment to a lot of young people. And I feel strongly that that we've got to do something to change that narrative. Absolutely. And I think one of the issues too, we need to stop labeling people because just because you are different doesn't mean you need to label in your front head that said you are this because you are not that. You are just unique. We are, is it all of us are unique? Even if we show it or not, we are all unique, you know? I might not show mm -hmm. it, doesn't mean I'm not. It's like we, we all have that little special things about us. And I'm grateful for what you are doing because as a mom, we need teachers like that. We need teachers that's kind of like look at it in a different way that I'm not just going to take this kid put in the, in the back of the classroom because, well, I just can't get that kid, the, put that kid that way. It's, it's not fair. And, and you are right when you say that um, coming out of high school, ready to go right this world, you know, ready to go to college and be the best of you that you can be. And that's what we want our kids to be because at the end, there are. The, you know, the next president, the next scientist, the next big thing in this world. And we need them to stay like that. And I was just very inspired when I was reading about all the great things you are doing. It's like, wow, that's a unique in a different way. And she's up to something huge. And I hope that she realized that how big this can get, because as mothers, we need um, other women that cares. Yes, absolutely. And I'm glad you said that. I'm a, I'm a mom. I have two elementary school age children and, and I want that for them too. My daughter, especially she has ADHD and, and I see a lot of the struggles in the classroom that she has that were similar to what I went through as a child. And I don't want her to have to, to have those same experiences. I, I don't want to see her struggle with her self-esteem or feel like she's not as capable as, as as accomplishing the things that she wants to as her peers are, because she is, she's just going to do it differently. And that's okay that it's going to look different. And, and I feel like every child deserves to have that message. Absolutely. And that's what's make her unique. That's what's make her special. And you know what? Yeah. That's what's make her smarter. <laughs> she's capable Absolutely. of doing a lot more than compared to other people. And, and nothing is yes. wrong with that. Being smart is nothing is wrong with being smart. So you are also a director of, uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying the name properly, Winfield Education Group, LLC. Yes. So what I am, I'm a director. Of, so the Winefield Education Group is an amazing group. It's an education advocacy group. Uh, I am the director of their social emotional programming. Uh, I, I love doing this job. This is where I am able to specifically help families that are in need of educational support. Maybe the school isn't 
uh, seeing the same thing that the family is seeing. Maybe there's disagreements. Maybe the parents just don't know how to navigate the process. But I specifically work with families who have students who are struggling with mental health needs in the setting. There's a lot of advocates within the firm that I work in who are fantastic and phenomenal, uh, and they help with a wide array of different areas. But I specifically only focus on students and families that have mental health needs. So, And that can look like diff different things that can be externalizing behaviors in the classroom setting, that can be internalizing behaviors in the classroom setting. And internalizing is more of those with drawn, not feeling as engaged, maybe they're quiet, maybe they have a hard time going to school, or it's a battle to get them to get up and go to school every morning. Uh, so that's kind of my specialty area is really helping those families who have students who are disengaged from the school setting and are having a hard time re-engaging or struggling when they are there. Maybe they hide in the bathroom, maybe they don't feel confident about themselves, maybe there have been histories of hospitalizations or suicidal ideations in the past, but my job is really to try and help to build back up that confidence and make school a setting where they they feel like they can be successful again. Wow, that's amazing. And and how do you actually um, approach the adults for them to like, because there's so many different kids when you work with so many different kids, how do you adopt that for each one of them to be able to control that itself? So I try to look at it a lot differently than schools look at it, whereas I feel like schools are looking at groups. I look at the individual and I really try to tailor, even when I was a classroom teacher, I try to tailor the educational experience to the individual because we all are different. Our brains are all different. Our needs are all different. Uh, for example, I have had students in the past who had histories of not attending school, and it was a setting piece for them. As soon as they were able to access a setting that wasn't as overwhelming for them or they weren't one of 1,000 kids trying to navigate the hallway, they were happy to go to school every single day. It was never a matter of them not wanting to go to school. It's just the setting was overwhelming. It was too much for them. And that was the fix that made it so that they wanted to go to school. But I also had other students who it wasn't just a setting piece. They had to build that confidence back up from the ground. And so we would practice, can we touch the front door of the school today? And can we walk through the front door of the school today? But it was tailored to who they were and what they needed in that moment. I think oftentimes kids go through these these moments or these difficulties and we just expect them zero to 100. I think we we're seeing that a lot with the pandemic, the return from school from pandemic, that you know we just expected kids to go back into school like nothing had ever happened. It's going to be normal. After almost two years of, I can go to the bathroom when I want. I can get a snack when I want. I have flexibility in my day. And we just told them, forget that. We're going back to the way things were. And, and kids don't process that well. They need they need that flexibility. And, and there's no reason not to allow them to have a snack or have a movement break or, or to incorporate some of these flexibilities within the classroom setting that we know are, are good for children, that we know is good for their brain and for their development. But it was like we just wanted to go right back to the old way of doing things back from zero to 100 and kids weren't ready for that they just they weren't mentally and socially prepared to go back to just as if in some the pandemic had never happened dr christa you made a great point look at it this way if us as adults having a hard time going back to the job place mm -hmm. how do we think the kids are feeling i don't think anyone ever think right? of that at all it's okay, honey. Right? You can go back to your school with your friends. Everything is just normal. But make sure you wash your hands and wear your mask. Really? <laughs> And we, even as adults, have a hard time expressing, you know, why we needed the change. It was just like, we realized, like, oh, this is not working for me. I need a change. I need, I need to, you know, my life needs to look different. I need a structure. But kids don't always have the words or the ability to express that, too. So that's why you see maybe behaviors are withdrawn or, or not socially engaged at school, because they sometimes have that, that difficulty in trying to recognize what it is that is bothering them or what doesn't feel right. Because we as adults are even trying to struggle with what that is and what we're trying to to regulate ourselves and get back to some sense of normalcy. So if we, as, you're right, if we as adults are struggling with that, why would we expect our youth to just automatically know how to handle and walk through that? Exactly. So do you think that, that that's a conversation that needs to start at home and, to, and also into the classroom? I 
think so. I think it's important for parents to be aware of how their children are feeling and to talk to them about it. You know, how are you feeling coming out of this? What is school like? What is what are the challenges that you're facing? What do you wish school looked more like? Because to me, the only way we're ever going to change what school looks like is if there are people who have a voice and say, you know, the old way of doing things it doesn't work anymore. You know, our kids demand this. This is what they need. This is where they feel like they're going to thrive or be successful. And I think it's good to have kids feel like they have a voice too, that people are taking their needs into account. I feel like we have evolved so much as far as technology goes, what we've exposed children to has all changed, but yet we're still operating education within within a system that has not evolved at all or has not changed at all. And, And what students needed 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 20 years ago is very different to what students today need, but we haven't done anything to really change education to to meet what children today are in need of to be successful. I completely agree. So I so at the end of the day, the conversation is starting from home, but also I think the what you're saying the teachers also and the school system should take a part of it to make it easy for them as well. Yes, I definitely think the, the conversation should start at home, but then schools need to start adapting to try and meet the needs of students. I completely agree with that. <laughs> so you started a business in the middle of the pandemic. What are the challenges you faced? You know, it, it's it's so funny. I I was nervous, but I think because, because education is really in in a tough spot right now, I think is the best way to put it. I think nationwide, we have seen that a lot of teachers have exited the profession. It's left schools with a lack of resources and it's created a little bit of a vicious cycle of students not getting the supports that they need, parents getting upset because their child isn't getting what they need to be successful, schools feeling overwhelmed because they don't have the resources to provide that. So if anything, um, it just happened to be coincidental that the profession that I'm aligned with still had an area of of need, uh, of anything that need picked up because of the pandemic. So even though it was a very scary step to to start my business in the middle of the pandemic, I think there was a, a need for it because of what was going on educationally. And uh, I always tell people I am trying to actively work myself out of a job. I, you know, in, in an ideal world, you wouldn't need me because every communications would be flowing. School systems would look exactly like they need to. Kids would be getting what they need. No questions asked. So I, I, ideally, I'd love to work myself out of a job, but I don't see that changing uh, anytime in the near future, at least just because I feel like we have a lot of growth and change and development that's going to be happening happening over the next several years in the education landscape. I know that many districts um, nationwide are facing massive teacher shortages, which is just, I feel like, going to compound students' needs being met um, and the success rates of students in the classroom. So I definitely see an ongoing need. So although it was a leap of faith to start my, my business in the middle of the pandemic, it, it definitely, I think, uh, was something that was needed at this time. Absolutely. And you know something that you said that it, there's a lot of changes that we need to make with the school system. And I think that it needs to start with the teachers. We need to pay the teachers more money. I, I don't think, think people... Start there. I agree. Because I don't, I don't think people understand the the impact that teachers face. And, and I'm saying this as someone who has been a classroom teacher. I think oftentimes people think you get to show up, you do your, you know, eight to three, and then you're just done for the day and you get your summers off. But but it's not that. You take on so many different roles. You you have to plan. You have to prep. They're constantly changing the curriculums on you. You're constantly getting messages from state, from federal level of changing programs, or now you have to do this, this thing. The amount of paperwork that goes along with it. I mean, if you you have 150 students that you see in a given day, even if it's a small assignment, that's 150 that you are are grading. Think of a, a massive paper or a long project, like 150 of those on a daily basis. You, you take work home. You work all summer going to professional developments and mandated training. So I think people have this very skewed idea of what a teacher is and what they do versus what the reality of what a teacher is and the work that goes into it. I mean, I'll put in comparison, I had 
three degrees and my husband had one degree and he was making tons more money than I was. So, I mean, I had educationally put myself very deep into trying to understand what our youth needed. And, and there wasn't really a lot of give back for even having expanded myself educationally. And so I really feel for teachers that, and I think that's why you're seeing a lot of teachers go, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore because they realize their, their value. Um, but the respect and is not there and the support is not there. And every year, I feel like more and more of what teachers had got taken away. And, and that was impactful for teachers. And, and teachers are expected to be mom, dad, uh, social worker, counselor. I mean, so many different roles. And there are people who are teachers who love doing that. They're there for kids. That's why they became teachers. But there's people who are in the profession who I love math. So that's why I'm a teacher because I love the content and not necessarily because I love kids. So you get such a big discrepancy and, and it just, it doesn't create uniformity and it creates these divides. And then teachers just don't get, they don't get the support, the love and the compassion that I think they all deserve for the dedication that they are providing to students and, and, and the work that they are putting in for students. And Dr. Christine, I can't really blame them because it's a lot of work because you look at it this way as, as if, even as a mom, you drive your kids to school, let's say seven o'clock. You pick up your kids from school, let's say 3 p.m. So not only the entire that time, your kid is spending it with someone else. Don't that, don't we should care about that person because that person is taking care of our kids instead of us doing it. Like you said, they be, it's like being like not just a teacher because you become that mom, like especially if it's a little kid, that little kid needs to go to the bathroom. So you have no choice to just help that kid. It's like a lot of things you get to actually teach it to that kid. And that can become a part of your life and you get to, you know, create a connection actually, there. Absolutely. You could see my office right now. I still have pictures just lined up from kids that I have taught who are now adults with children of their own. But I mean, they, they become a, a part a part of you and, and they're meaningful to you and, and they're a piece of your life. And I think as a teacher, you hope you you mean that way to them. But kids mean that way to you, too. Like the their successes are your successes. Their failures are your failures. You're very invested in in these children and 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 their success and their future. And, and I don't think people realize how much emotional aspect goes into being an educator too, and the, the amount of care. And I think unfortunately we've seen in tragedy situations too, like te teachers are willing to put their li lives on the line for, for children because they're like your like you said, they're it's like their children while they're there with them during the day that you know. And I always considered myself that role, not that I was replacing anybody's mother or anything, but like I am your adult. I am your safe person. I am the person who's supposed to be looking out for your best interest and caring for you while you are here with me during the day. Like what happens to you to me is on me because I am essentially your caretaker, your teacher, and the person who is responsible for you during that day. Exactly. Do you think that um one of the issue can be because we have more teacher, more women that are teachers than men. So uh, they looked at it where they have to keep the pay lower because of that uh, part of it. That's a really great question, and I know that that has come up a lot lately with everything that is going on, and and that's been something that has been brought about with females being the the predominant individuals in the education setting, and. You know, I don't I don't know. I don't know if it's pay uh, because it's females. I don't know if it's because most of the time teacher pay comes from taxpayer money. And so it, it's it's being divided that way. I think that's a really great question. And there's probably maybe a little bit of all of it that's that's cycled in there. You know, maybe it's because it's been a predominantly female driven profession, maybe because it is taxpayer money. Um, so, you know, funds are limited and people tend to put resources, in my opinion, not always in the best place. You know, the taxpayer money goes to other things too. And, and I don't know that we always prioritize the programming and where the money should go into the right spaces. So I think there's so many factors at play and, and it's really sad to, um, this is on topic to your question, but a little off topic. But I think it, it's something to bring about talking about women in the teaching profession. 
many years ago when, you know, women didn't work. So I'm talking about the 1950s. A lot of people who women who did work were teachers. And these were women who would have otherwise been CEOs or, you know, major architects or something different in a different field, but they were limited in their academic options. And so they taught. And so you got women who were very focused on different areas or different interests or and different things who were who were in the teaching profession who now don't necessarily become teachers because teaching has gotten this this rap about it you don't make a lot of money you don't you know you're not very supported and i think about people who would be amazing teachers who probably would love to teach and, and you know it doesn't matter male female in this particular situation but who don't go into the profession because it's not seen as being this this highly revered profession. You don't make a lot of money doing it, but there's people who could bring ideas and skills and these other aspects to the profession that would be amazing. And these children are missing out on it because we have not valued this profession and we have not grown in in fostering it and allowing people to really come into this profession and make a difference and and have voices and be heard and make decisions based on what we know is best for children it's that has been hindered and, and to me that that is sad i think so to, sorry so to, i know i went <laughs> off on a tangent here but going back to your original question i think there's a lot of factors um just funding I think gender could definitely play a role in there. Um, and I think that's just something that's always, you know, it's always been women. And even though I know male teachers who are phenomenal, te phenomenal teachers, but you don't get as many male teachers. And I think it's important for kids to have male teachers too. And, yes. and especially for some of our young male students to be able to make that connection and see those role models. And so uh, it should be a more uh, equal profession where you have men, you have women of gender, color, everything. It should be across so children can see themselves in their teachers and, and see it as a profession that is a highly thought of profession. Absolutely. I completely agree with you on that. And I think that as a taxpayer myself, I think I'd rather my money goes where my kids is getting mm -hmm. what they need because at the end of the day, when I'm gone, that's who's going to keep on living for me. That's where my blood stays. So for me, it's important. I think that teachers should uh, get paid what they deserve and, and get the support that they need. Um, not getting, you know, pushed away or treating differently and make them feel bad because all the good ones will leave. And if all the good ones say, I don't want to be teachers anymore, then what's going to happen to our kids? So I think that's something the government I mean, should think about. And I think that's what we're going to start seeing starting this school year and for the next couple of years, I think that's what we're going to start seeing. And that worries me. And it worries about, you know, I, I'm a mom too. So like, what will it look like for our children? And what, what will be the quality of the teacher that is there? And I, it's, it's definitely an issue that I think will need to be addressed sooner rather than later. Very fast. Before it's, before it's out of hand and then our children just being, you know, abuse and all these things that we do not want to see. Absolutely. So can Absolutely. you tell us about the uh, No Diverse uh, Teacher podcast? I'm very interested to know uh, what is it all about. Yes. Yeah, so it's actually brand new. I'm really excited. I've got my first several guests all lined up and it's really supposed to be a podcast that is exploring neurodiversity, people's experience in education, because really what I want to create is a messaging for youth or young adults who were either neurodiverse themselves or maybe they just struggled in school, had a hard time with school. School wasn't their, their jam and their confidence was really impacted because, because of that. And I want them to be able to hear messages from individuals who maybe had the same experiences in school, but ultimately were really successful and didn't let that hold them back from their ambitions. Um, and they were able to really persevere and find success in their areas of passion. So it's really an opportunity for, for youth or young adults or even adults who maybe are still trying to figure out, you know, where where they can go in their life because they've, they've struggled either academically when they were younger or, or when they were in college or in whatever profession they were in to find inspiration that 
you're not alone, but other people have struggled and they can still find success, that they can still achieve what they want to. Um, and then some, sometimes the guests will also just be guests who can offer a new perspective or, or talk to you about growth mindsets or a way to take an approach or structure your life. But really, ultimately, it's designed to be a motivational aspect for the listeners to feel like, I feel really alone that maybe it's just me who struggled or I, you know, how am I ever going to achieve what I want to achieve when this is what school looked like for me or my earlier youth looked like for me to hear like, okay, that doesn't define me. I, I, I'm not alone in this, that I don't have to take that as this has condemned me to this type of life that other people have experienced this too and have still gone on to be successful. Well, that took us then. It seems like you're an animation to cover every single little thing you feel like that's missing. I feel like you're here to just black all the holes. It's like, okay, there's a hole here. Let's cover that one. This one needs to be, okay, that next one. Okay, next one. I feel like that's what that's your mission right now. You're looking for all of the pieces that's missing. Not only you are helping the one that's facing the problem now, but you're also focusing on the one that went through it. So how do we make that change? So that's amazing. <laughs> And I feel like hopefully they correlate in the sense that I'm trying to do the work now so that that's not an issue in the future. But I recognize that that work didn't exist in the past. And so there are people who are out there who still need that support and need to have that that motivation and that inspiration. So hopefully the work I'm doing now will eventually negate the need for that podcast because everybody will feel great about themselves. But I, I see it kind of as a two-parter right now. I, I want to start changing changing things for kids now, but I also want to hit those young adults, the youth or the adults who, who didn't have that when they were in school and are still struggling with that. I mean, ultimately, my, if I had to have one mission to sum everything up, it's I want people to feel good about who they are and what they're capable of achieving, no matter what their past has looked like, no matter how smart or not smart that they think they are. I want to make that clear because I think everyone is incredibly smart just in their own right. And I just I want everyone to feel good about who they are and feel like that their dreams are are attainable for them, no matter what those dreams are, that they shouldn't feel like something in their life is holding them back in any kind of way. Exactly. So do you feel, do you see all of these things you are doing? How do you see all of them come together as one in your future? So I, so I see it all as one under this brand of the neurodiverse teacher. So that's really kind of like this brand that I have created and how I see it coming together is I think of it as like a little umbrella and the, the neurodiverse teacher is my umbrella. You know, I do my advocacy work with families and that that's my piece of trying to help students where they are right now with school issues, with concerns and, and really trying to shape educationally what's going on. I see that podcast as the way of providing that, that motivation. And I'm hoping in the near future to move on to more speaking engagements too, Again, with that same kind of message kind of combined of the podcast and the advocacy work of really tailoring it to this is what we need to do for our youth in order for them to be able to feel this way in the future. I like that concept. So, I, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm on my own island a little bit with the, the model that it is, but I also try to remind myself that, you know, sometimes it's good to be on your own island and for me, the fact that it's alone and it's new and it's unique, maybe that will be what is needed right now. Maybe that's the catalyst that for the change that hopefully is, is needed to help students feel feel good about themselves and to be successful. I don't think you are alone. I think people are just watching and see how far you really want to take it before they become a resident in your island. I think that's what's happening right now. You are not actually like really alone. I like that. That makes me feel good. So thank you for saying that. <laughs> because what you are doing, I, I don't see any human beings on this earth that will say you don't want the best for your kid. You know, you, you just, why would you think you don't want the best? You want that. For me, the way I see it, the things that I went through in my childhood, I try to avoid it from happening to my kid so that I don't want my kids to experience that because it wasn't a happy ending. <laughs> it wasn't the best thing. So I want you to get the best of the best. The way you it's, it's the same way the way your parent treat you as a kid. You try to make it better for your kid and your kid will make it better for their kids. I think that's how it should be. Not um, 
not just keep doing the same thing that was from 1965 now. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I actually, that's actually a topic I talk on uh, pretty frequently and I, and I put it to a name, uh, generational trauma. And and we do, we, and I, I try to make it clear to people too, that you don't necessarily had to have had a bad childhood to have had childhood trauma, but sometimes parents do things the way that they were taught by their parents and they were taught by their parents and it gets passed down and it's not necessarily the best way or the most compassionate way to to do things and it didn't mean you you didn't have a loving or caring parent now there are some people obviously who were in very different situations where it is abusive or it is hurtful and the trauma it's like it's there's nothing other than it being trauma, but there are people who still live in supportive and loving environments who still deal with generational trauma because just the way that their parents handled a situation was how they learned how to handle a situation from their parent isn't necessarily the most compassionate or validating of feelings or supportive way of handling things. And that can still scar you as a child and make you feel like your feelings weren't valid or that you weren't heard. And that's still stuff that to work through even if you think you came from a loving home, you still have to work through that stuff and those fact that those were feelings that you felt and that you had to deal with and cope with as a child. Exactly. And you know what? I'll give myself as a great example. My mom uh, loved all, her, all of her kids, but my mom also has five kids. So she has a lot to handle as a mother. And also she has to work to take care of all those five kids. So at the end of the day, we had to grow up very fast so that we can help. As a second child, I had to grow up so that I can help with the little ones. Now, I did. I felt like in my life I could have spent more time with my mom. The fact that I get to her business, that's the only way I spend a lot of time with my mom because I was always with her on, on her business, handle, helping her handle her business. But I don't want my kid to feel that he has to be a part of my business to get my attention and my love. So I tried to change that. And I felt like to even when I got pregnant, with my life experience, I used that like, wait a minute. My mom wasn't always there for me. Now, not because she was a bad mom, but because she was trying to provide. And she has to provide because she has to feed us. So she has to do what she got to do to do that. So, but I can change that. I can actually create a company where my time, I control it so I can help my kids, so I can be there for my kids. And that's what I changed. So my change wasn't really a trauma where like, you know, I'm angry at my mom for not always. I get to understand it that, well, she doesn't work. She can't feed us. So at the end, she has to get to, you know, she got to go to work. No, so, and, and you did exactly what you're supposed to do, right? You... You recognize, I think as an adult, you start to realize like, okay, my parents worked or, you know, they were tired because they worked all day. And so their time was limited. And I think you recognize that as an adult, but there's still like this hurt child in you a little bit that still didn't, that didn't understand those concepts when you were younger and those feelings still existed. And I think you're doing exactly what you're supposed to do is you're recognizing that perspective as an adult. This is why it was this way, but what can I do now to try and help my child not to have those feelings that I had when I was? child yes exactly and that's, and that's what and that's what we should do as, as as parents we have to look at these things like it's not really a bad thing that's happened to you but mm -hmm. it's something that's important that you wanted it you didn't get it. perhaps you can make sure your kid get that attention from you that you didn't get from your parents even even as i remember as a teen or even as, as a young adult i didn't really understand a lot of things and I have to tell you, the day I gave birth, I remember when my mom came the next day and uh, that day I called her and I was like, hey, I'm so sorry for everything I ever put you through in your life. Mm -hmm. Now I understand it because I'm looking at that little kid in my hand. It's like, what am I supposed to do? That's a lot of work here. <laughs> my life yes. just changed. And, but I never understand what my mom went through with five kids compared to me that's only have one. And I only see it as a lot of work. So I guess uh, those, all these things and be able to see you actually look at it that way, it's making a huge difference because I never really talked to anyone that's seen it that way, that things will happen, but we also have to understand why they happen and try to help our kids and get the help our kids need to make sure that they don't happen to that kid. Yes, yes. And that, that takes a level of awareness too. I mean, I give you a lot of credit because there are a lot of adults 
who who don't realize yet that that is what's happening or that's what they've experienced. You know, it, to me, it, to them, it's just, oh, well, this is norm. This is how it was supposed to be. You know, this is how it was done. And so it definitely takes this level of awareness and essentially a growth mindset to recognize it and then take the action to try to make the change. So I give you a lot of credit because it's, it's not it's not an easy thing to do. Yes, that's for sure. But you know what? I'm just grateful. I learned so much from my mom as a business person. Um, I, I learned from her failures. I learned from her success and be able to actually create woman to help women and actually use that. I have to say my my son was the purpose, was the main purpose of me wanting to do that in the first place. So at the end, it's kind of like we have to appreciate our children because sometimes they the other one will bite our lives and we should want to do the best for them and us in the school system. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you, you have been impacting people's lives in such a unique manner. And um, I'm pretty sure that is very satisfying. But how do you cope with the times that you feel overwhelmed or out of your zone? That's a really great question. And and I'll be honest, there have been times in my life where I have felt incredibly overwhelmed. In fact, when kind of the catalyst to make the change from leaving the classroom to starting my business was because I was going through a period in my life where I felt really overwhelmed. Uh, I had, my mother was sick with throat cancer. Um, I had two small children. We had had some issues in, in the school setting that I had been in. And so I felt overwhelmed and I felt out of control. And it, it took me probably a good two years to, to really kind of cycle through that. And I still have days where I feel overwhelmed, but I did a lot of work on myself. And, and when I say I did work on myself, you know, I went to therapy. I talked through my emotions. I learned about things like generational trauma and try to understand my parents' perspectives, try to understand the feelings that I felt when I was a child. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time talking with people with different life experiences or different perspectives and, and not from a, a place of, of judgment or like, oh, your opinion's wrong or my opinion's right. I, I don't believe in that. I feel like I love to hear people who have different opinions than me because I'm looking for the, oh, I've never thought of it that way. And, and to me, I spent a lot of time trying to go through growth as an individual and really understand that I only have so much life experience, but I can have more by allowing other people to share their experiences with me and giving me their perspectives or what they've had to go through or what has been a struggle in their life. And maybe I, I can only be sympathetic or to, on to a degree because I didn't personally experience it, it, but it gives me the perspective. It allows me to now understand something that I didn't know existed or somebody had had to go through or what that felt like for them. So I really tried to spend several years of my life trying to really expand on that. And that helped me get to know myself better um, and, and come to a realization that maybe I didn't even know who I was or really, you know, I was pushing dreams that I thought were, you know, satisfying to my parents or to the people around me, what, what was expected of me from other people, and maybe not so much what was expected of myself. And, and that process helped me to start to really start to get to know myself better. And so when I do go through these moments of feeling overwhelmed or feeling out of control, I, I'm able to almost have like a better internal conversation with myself. Whereas I feel like I used to maybe beat myself up and be like, well, if you had only done that better, if you had done it this way, you know, those kind of like self-defeating conversations we've had, I've, I now have a lot more compassion for myself. You know, it's like, it's okay. Feel those feelings. Those are valid feelings. We're going to feel them. We're going to move through them. And then we're going to move on. Or if I'm starting to feel bad about something, it's like, it's okay. It maybe didn't go the way that you wanted it to, but take this as a learning opportunity or take this as a lesson for the next time or apply this a different way. And I've just tried to change the perspective. Uh, and that has made a huge difference. It's not easy. It's not something that comes naturally. I think there's work associated with doing that. But that has been kind of where I have have started to shift my thinking is just on my perspective. How can I look at this a different way rather than feeling like the world is against me? How can I be grateful for everything that's going on? And how can I use this as a growth opportunity rather than feeling, you know, a pity party for one? Exactly. So I love that. Learn You learn to appreciate life because at the end of the day, we only have one. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> 
So how can school or even parents use your services? Absolutely. So um, schools can use me if they're looking for opportunities to expand their teacher knowledge. That was a lot of what my research was based in was on teacher knowledge of mental health attitudes towards mental health. So really helping teachers to understand what does mental health look like? Um, what can that be in a classroom setting? What can I do if I come across it? But a lot of the work I also do with families that they can connect with me on, if they go to www.theneurodiverseteacher.com, there's a link for advocacy. It will take you to the Weinfeld Education Group website. And, and what I can do for them is help them with an array of different things. Um, sometimes I'm an expert witness uh, in court cases. So I give my opinion and expertise on brain development in uh, a particular individual, depending on what the case dynamics are. But also most of the time I spend supporting families in school-based meetings, being a representative for the family so that they feel like their voice is being heard, helping them with the, through the legal process of what either special education looks like or just the procedures and processes that are associated with school systems. The nice thing, if I have to find a silver lining for the pandemic, is with virtual meetings now being a big thing, I am able to cover a much larger uh, demographic or not uh, area of services. So um, even though I live in one spot, I'm helping families hours and hours away from me because I can participate in virtual meetings. So that's, that's something that even though I'm kind of based in the Washington, D.C. area, Families can use me all over. I, I've helped as far as California in some cases as well. So being able to be that guide, helping parents. I think some of the things I've heard from parents that's the scariest for them is they just don't know what the process looks like. They don't know when they're being told that something that's accurate or they're, they're not being told all the information or they don't know what options exist for their child. And, and that's where I can come in and I can really help them not navigate what procedures, processes, timelines, what everything should look like. I can go into meetings with them and I can be that voice who can speak up to the school teams and say, ah, I don't think so. I think this is what needs to be done for this kid or this is really what it should look like or why did you make those decisions for this child? So that is what I spend a lot of time doing and that's where I can most help families is if they want to be involved in, with me and work with me as their advocate or their consultant and helping them um, just navigate any kind of school or educational processes that they feel like they're struggling with their child. Wow. I wish more people would do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes we just need that person who went through who, who, all the experience that you have because you know everything how it works and, and things like that. So... Do you have any plan to go back next year as a teacher, like in September? You know, I, I don't. I, I will admit I miss I miss working with students. I do. I loved work. I, I can't say enough how I, much I loved working with students, and I miss that the most. But ultimately, when I made the decision to leave the classroom, the decision I made was because I feel like I can make a larger impact this way. I feel like the message that I feel like youth needs to hear, I can do this way. Um, I'm no longer an agent of a school system, so I don't have to mind my P's and Q's as much. I can say what I think needs to be done. I can say where I think there's issues or concerns or things that need to be changed without having to, you know, the fact that I'm a school system employee representative type of thing, you know, I don't have to worry mm -hmm. about that anymore. And so I feel like I'm in a position now to help more families, more students um, to use the knowledge that I have, not in just one school and one setting and one district, but I can use it much more broadly. And so um, I don't have plans to go back because I'm, I'm hoping I, I'm able to make a bigger impact being where I am at now, doing what I'm doing now. So my next question for you is how... How can we help you? How can us as women help you so that you can help our children? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I feel like just allowing me opportunities like this, this, this opportunity to chat with you and, and share a little bit about who I am and what I do. Hopefully uh, readers will and, and watchers or listeners will be able to say, hey, you know, I didn't know this existed. That's what I hear a lot. People are like, I didn't know that that was a job that even existed and that people like you existed. 
I exist. So having just the opportunity to tell people that I'm out here, that I, I'm knowledgeable, that I have the experience and I, I want to help you, I want to help your child. That's the biggest thing that you can do to, to help or support me is doing exactly what you're doing right now and allowing me this platform to, to talk about who I am and what I do and let people know that I'm out there to help them and their child. And we are grateful that you are doing that. Like you said, we never heard of that. Even when I hear, I'm like, what? What is that exactly? So I have to sit there and read and read. I'm like, this is amazing. That exists. Oh, well, so, good. I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, so it's awesome to know it exists. And I'm sure pe uh, people that will be listening, watching, reading, uh, will be grateful to know it's there when they need it. Because that's something we need. We need that. So don't ever feel like you are alone because you are not alone. Just give us time Absolutely. to process it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I needed that, that encouragement. Do you have any advice uh, for young entrepreneurs, for young women entrepreneurs? I would say, you know, if you have a dream or you have a goal, go for it. I will say if there's anything I've learned in my life, um, I'm almost 40 years old at this point in time. And regret, I feel like is a much harder sting than failure. Failure has room for growth and failure can teach you lessons. Whereas regret just like sits like a rock in your gut. So my, my advice to any, any young entrepreneur or especially female entrepreneurs, you have a goal. And if you have a vision, even if it seems like the craziest thing and you feel like the people in your life around you are, are worried about what it's going to look like or what people think or how it's going to be successful. Don't, don't listen. Like if you have the passion and you feel like it's something that's important to you, go for it. It's so much easier to fail and learn from those failures. Look at them as a lesson say, this is how I've got to adjust. This is how I'm going to make version 2.0, 3.0 of whatever my goal, my vision is than to wake up 20 years later and be like, I wish I had tried and I never did. So my advice is if you have a goal, if you want to just, do it. Go for it. Don't let anybody stop you. If, if you have a will, there is a way and, and, and find whatever that is that you need to make to make that dream a reality for yourself. Wow. I don't know what else to say. I don't want to say anything. I just want to leave it the way it is because it's well said. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, Kristen. I appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge and to explain to, to us everything that you are doing. And um, if you ever feel like we are not being supportive, uh, that's, that is not true. There's women out there that want to support other women. So don't feel like you are alone. And when you feel alone, all you have to do is reach out. You know, Thank just reach you. out. So there's other women Thank out there that want to support. And what you are doing as mother myself, I know it's important and we need it. I appreciate the time and your knowledge. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for this opportunity. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Mental health is a subject we tend to put aside and try very hard not to talk about. But it is also a necessary conversation we should have more often. Don't you think so? I am grateful to have this conversation with Dr. Kristen. Thank you, Dr. Kristen, for taking the time to have this conversation with me. Let me know your thoughts about this episode with Dr. Kristen. To learn more about Dr. Kristen, please visit www.thenoradiverseteacher.com. Thank you for listening to Female Founders Podcast. That's it for this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast app or connect with us on warmel.com so that you don't miss our next episode. See you next time. Bye for now.